Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Anyway Whatever podcast. I'm your host, Mike Fisher, and today's guest is artist Jermaine Rogers. A lot of people who listen to this show are going to be familiar with Jermaine's work. Um, he's you know, he's ex very established. He's <laughs> he's done very well for himself in the art world. He may, he has toys. He's he's a printmaker, um, artist, writer, thinker, and um, this was a great episode. Just sitting and talking with with an old friend of mine getting caught up and, uh, you know, talking about his art and art in general. We, we go we go into some deep dives about art, art theory, opinions about art and all of that stuff. Really fantastic episode. Jermaine is an incredibly interesting guy. Uh, we've been friends for probably 20 years now and, or at least. And uh, yeah, I, this was was really nice to sit down with him. As always, if you are listening to the podcast version, you can subscribe wherever it is you get your podcast content, leave us a review, share the episode uh, to other people you think might like what we got going on. If you are watching the YouTube version, hit subscribe and click the bell to make sure you get updates about our weekly episode releases. And, uh, you know, we have shirts and we have merch, pins, you know, buttons, uh, stickers, the whole thing. And you can find the links to that in the description below. And as always, uh, I appreciate everybody's support. You know, the show's doing great and I'm having a good time making it, especially when I get to talk with people like Jermaine, uh, who have been an influence on my work and my life over the years. So yeah, enjoy. <laughs> Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Anyway Whatever podcast. As always, I'm your host, Mike Fisher, and today's guest is artist Jermaine Rogers. Um, what's up, Jermaine? How you been, man? I've been doing good, man. How about you? I've been good. I've been good. I've been staying busy with this show, but otherwise, <laughs> you know, just trying not to focus too much on the weird world, we, <laughs> the weird timeline we live in right now. Uh, oh, man. Congratulations on the show, man. Oh, thank you very much, man. I appreciate yeah. that. I appreciate you giving me your time to come on, man. You're, you wow. know, we, we go, we go way, way, way back. Um, and you kind of gave me, actually, you kind of gave me a little bit of credibility in the poster scene where I, we'd kind of, you, you needed a piece of art for a thing that you didn't have time to do. And I, and I, you know, I did that VW bus for that Fu Manchu poster. And um, after uh, that, yeah. you know, the work just started coming and I, you know, got pretty much, both feet into the rock poster world at that point. So I, I owe you a little bit there at least. Oh man. Oh no. No, I don't I don't know if I did you a favor or not, man. Getting you into this <laughs> madness. <laughs> uh I you know, you know, you know, I when I moved to LA in, in like ninety five, one of the first days at my at my video game job, we went to like, you know, Lelou's to Jesus, like on like a lunch break and I got one of the first copies of, of Juxtapose. I think it was maybe issue three. And it just had Frank Kozik stuff all in it. And I was like, yeah, I want to do that. Like, that's right. what I want to be doing. And then, um, and so I, you know, in like 96, 97, I did like probably four screen printed posters and then just fell off of it. And then when gigposters.com started back up, you know, Clay hit me up and then I just found myself <laughs> in that job. <laughs> <laughs> for for a number of years like a lot of us right right are you doing are you doing band posters anymore are you just doing art prints at this point well i you mean know, aside from the pandemic and there being no concerts yeah i mean basically i mean it's funny because i'm very selective on gig posters now i mean i'll do stuff with people that i kind of already have a a, a relationship with um so, I mean, like, you know, in the last three or four years, I mean, you know, it's, it's a small list. It's, it's like, you know, Nine Inch Nails, uh, Run the Jewels, just things that I want to do. But, yeah, I'm to a point now to where uh, I really enjoy, um, you know, art prints and, you know, the, the design of vinyl and resin figures mm -hmm. and all of that. It gives me a little bit more freedom. Uh, but I'm not opposed to a, 
a gig poster every every now and then. <laughs> yeah, I, you, I, yeah, you, you kind of started doing the toy thing. What, probably about fifteen years ago with the Darrow figures, and then the Squire. You can everybody can see the little the little Squire up on the on the deck above above Jermaine there. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> so what was that? Was like about fifteen years ago, I guess, mid two thousands. You started doing those. Yeah, I mean, I started working on the Darrow <laughs> figure in like two thousand three, and it came out in two thousand four. So, uh, and then yeah, after that, I think Squire was two thousand five, and then Bale figures came out in like oh seven, and, and and from then on, it was a you know a progression, but. Yeah, it's been a minute, dude. Time, uh, <laughs> now the clock on the wall, it uh, teases you. It does, man. Uh, we were before we started recording, we were talking about how old <laughs> my <laughs> kids and his and his daughter are. We were just like shaking our head, like, "Oh my god, where is all where are all these years <laughs> gone, man?" It's crazy. I mean, because you know, I think we probably became associated, man, in like. 2000 i'd guess 2001 yeah. so i think we've been friends for like 20 years now which is crazy <laughs> which yeah. is crazy yeah. uh it's awesome man uh you know i've always valued uh i've always valued your um your way of seeing the world and um your thoughtfulness about things uh just like as a person aside from you know you know the things you do as an artist so you oh, know thanks man that's kind of you to say <laughs> like, likewise we've had a, we've had some good conversations we have yeah. over the years we've we've had some good ones like there, there was a time uh a lot of the listeners um to my podcast are familiar with gigposters.com because they were either users of the website or they were artists who were on the website you know there's a lot of um people uh, in my audience from the gig posters and, and people who aren't are familiar with it now from a lot of the talking about it. But, um, for a while there in the, in the early two thousands, there was this group of us on gig posters.com that we kind of referred to as the night crew. It was like <laughs> me and you and Richie and Frank. And, um, we would all like listen to coast to coast and then <laughs> sit, <laughs> sit on the message board and shoot the shit in a thread for, you know, like hours, like every night, like for, yeah. it was crazy. Like how much, <laughs> how much time got spent there while we, and you know, we would all be working and listening to coast to coast and chatting with each other. It was really great. Right. It's good times, man. Yeah. That, those, those days were, uh, I don't know. You know, they, they always, I, when I was, when I was a lot younger, I had a, a friend of the family, this old guy named Bill Farnham, who's been dead now for like 30, 40 years. But, he used to tell me when I was a kid, uh, you know, he used to say, nobody realizes, nobody realizes that good old days are good old days while they're happening. So he said, you can, he said, you can cheat. <clears throat> realize that at any moment, uh, no matter how bad it seems, you will romanticize that time. And um, so, yeah, so, I mean, I kind of had that little cheat code from an old man. <laughs> so during those gig posters years like as as we were doing that and as we would be working and i mean it would be like you'd wake up in the morning you eat you do whatever you do you sit down in your studio you turn all your stuff on and you'd log on to gig posters it was just there in the background and um yeah. so that was a part of me that uh really that was a part of me that was very much realizing that you know one day i may miss this <laughs> And so, uh, and yeah, and true enough, you know, I think back about that. It's a shame that the site is gone because uh, that place was, you know, people always talk about the the artwork, you know, the images, the foundry, and that's true. But those conversations mm -hmm. were an intimate look at a scene like in like the pivotal part of its evolution. I mean, it's like some of those conversations and some of the the static between people the, you know, it, mm -hmm. that that stuff would be invaluable to to a young artist to read, you know. I mean, yeah. And, and when you think about, uh, you know, I had Andrew Barksdale on and we were talking about uh, in particular, like how many people got full blown careers out of their yeah. time spent on gig posters? Like it's crazy how yeah. many people went on to either be artists who work for themselves like you, who are, you know, who just like a full-time artist to people who got crazy 
crazy jobs. Like, you know, Barksdale and Lonnie Hurley, you know, they went on to work at Nike forever. You know, yeah. that's like, that's a, that is a big job in the design oh. world to, to work at a company like Nike, you know what I mean? And it's like, just the amount of people who got careers out of that is out of that one website. It's super crazy. Like there's no yeah. way I am where I am as an artist without it. There's no way. No. I mean, none of us. I mean, I, you know, it's funny. Cause like, I, when I talk about gig posters with people, especially people who weren't there, um, it, it was so pivotal because for, for like the mass history of, of art, scenes always developed, um, they were always geographically based. Right, Lo there was always like local, local yeah. scenes kind of. Yeah, so like if you, you know, if, if, if you lived in the fucking whatever, if you lived in the late 1800s, 1920s, and you wanted to be an artist, like at some point, if you wanted to be taken seriously, you went to Paris, you, you just right. did. In the 50s and the 60s, you went to New York City. Late 60s, you wanted to do rock and roll, you wanted to do like you went to San Francisco, you know? Mm -hmm. And gigposters.com, and I may be, I don't know, somebody might prove me wrong on this, but as far as I know, that is the first major genre of art that had its developmental like center in cyberspace. That was no geographic. So like you could be from anywhere mm -hmm. and gigposters.com was where the evolution was happening. So, I mean, I remember some of those days when people would just show up. I remember like the first time Leia Bell just showed up <laughs> and, and posted her art. And like, and, and like in a month, she was like, like, no, she was yeah. like getting jacked, you know? And it, it was, so it was, it's really, it was a really pivotal place because, um, yeah, I really think in many ways, man, that place is going to reverberate. The further away we get from it, like me and you talking about it right now, twenty years later, and we're not even, and we don't even realize how important it was. Like, it, right, you know? right, yeah, I, I think you're right. Like, I mean, you know, I, that's been that's been brought up kind of on the on the show before too, where it's like, where in history have that many working professional artist congregated and spoken to each other every day for that yeah. length of time. You know, it's like, like you were saying, like in Paris, you know, in like the 1920s, like, yeah, it was like packed full of people, but that was Paris. Like we had people from Holland. We had people from, from all over the world, Canada, United States, every yeah. single state in the United States. And it was like daily, all day, daily all conversations day. about, all night. <laughs> about art. You know, yeah, I mean, it really was almost 24 hour. It was almost a 24 hour yeah. cycle on there. Um, Everything that was happening was being pushed through that. And I, I remember like with me, th there's a little part of me that's glad, sadly. There's a little part of me that's glad that it's gone. And I'll tell you, because because that was certain things like that I said on that site and things that I did on that site that like, are so embarrassing, right? I mean, <laughs> but I, but you know, for me, it was very much like I came onto this site and suddenly I was surrounded by people like me. So that was a part of me, and I can say it now, I could never say it back then. That was a part of me that was very much trying to impress everybody. Sure. And very much trying to say, like, I want to be a part. But then that was that other part of me, based on my background and who I am and where I come from, that was another part of me that I was like fist up all the time, man. I was like, I, I felt like I had to, like I had to prove to these people like that I belong here, you know? Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I know the music, I know the art. This goes into a whole lot of racial stuff. And I like, yeah, like, yeah. And so, I, you know, and, and I was like the only person at the time, I was like me and, and, and uh, El Negro Magnifico, and uh, that was a couple of us, you know, but it was like, I always felt like, you know, do these guys take, you know, and I'll be honest, like, thankfully, there's a big part of me that has never, like, cared a whole lot. You know, I, I've, sure. I've kind of just done what I want to do. But that was that part of me, man, that, that little part of me that cared quite a bit. 
and I wanted to feel like I was a part of something and I wanted people to feel like, like I was part of the thing. And so sure. It was a weird time because uh, <laughs> we were all know, trying to get established, yeah, man. Like we, we trying were to trying to, yeah. we were trying to put our stamp on, on something and it was growing fast and it was something that we loved so much. And we, I think there was a lot of us that were like that. Um, and so I totally get that. And, and the thing that's funny for me as a person it, um, is that uh, I was, I am so different now as a human being. Uh, my headspace, how I see the world, how I interact with the world that, um, you know, I, I am in the same way kind of glad cause I'm like, ah, you know what? Like I was <laughs> probably, cause I talk to people all the time and they're like, Oh, well, you're not an asshole at all. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, Oh God, it, that's my legacy from the, the Brock poster world. I don't know no, if I feel that not. great about that. You know what I mean? Like I was on Bricky's show. I was on adventures in design yeah. and even, even me and him like had to break through that a little bit at first of the, like, you know, he kind of came out, you know, with his fists up about like, Hey, you know, with the persona of, with the under the, the idea of that I was some person that was this entity on the internet that he knew in a certain way. And I was like, ah, oh, man, <laughs> I'm not that dude no, at yeah. all. And, um, and, and it, I mean, it's totally fine. Like I, I, I completely understand. I was, you know, I was kind of an asshole around there sometimes. <laughs> uh, but you know, well, you know not like Richie. <laughs> no, nobody's like Richie. No, I mean, like, but it was, it's, it's the it, kind of the thing about, it's kind of the dynamic about being an artist. I tell people like who have straight jobs, regular jobs, like it's, I, I'm sure like, for instance, some guy who works in, you know, in some office somewhere, like, and he's worked there for like 20 years. Right. And like, I'm that, there are days that he had run-ins with the dude in the mail room. There are days that he, <laughs> said things that he shouldn't have said and that and they patched it up that days when he you know, indiscretions you know and nobody knows about it because you move on and it's a small group of people when you're an artist like you do everything openly and in public and so these things that you do or that you say especially if you put it into your work um yeah, they never they never go away, and and there's always people there to like say, well, what did you mean when you said that, and did you believe this, and or do you believe this, or, and so it's um, it's part of the thing, dude. We sort of live with our with our insides out, you know. Yeah, and I, you know, to be honest, like I, I I'm totally fine with everything. Like in you know, I, I don't I definitely don't feel like there's anything that I would be like ashamed to have said or done um, yeah i don't you know, yeah i don't there. think and, you know, you know yeah. because i know who i am and like the core of who i am is you know it's i'm the same person i always have been but you know i was like gonna you know i was like i was raising three kids and working a job i hated you know 12 hours a day and then coming home and working another five or six hours on my own art and like you know like yeah. i was i had so much pressure on me throughout the 2000s <laughs> that it, I I had no business trying to be nice to nobody. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean that's what made the place so real because everybody was dealing with their own different types of pressure. But sure. the strange that what made it so was so special is that all of these everybody's that we were seeing every day that was dealing with all the pressure, all of those everybody's were artists. So right. you so the so so the pressures they were dealing with were being sort of regurgitated out in these weird ways, you know, like weird things that they say, weird things that they do, like, and um, so, yeah, dude, it was a special place. And I hope somewhere, I heard that Clay said that everything is lost. And I really it hope can't that be. it can't be. There has like, to be backups from 20 years worth of that. It has, there has <laughs> to be. I can't, there's no way it's all, it's just, just I know Both too much the, the about how just... about how computers and the, <laughs> and the internet and backups work. Uh, you know, I know data centers and how they work, and it, yeah. it, it's somewhere. 
Those forums, man. That's that's to me. That's the thing. Those forums, man, yeah. were just. Uh, I mean, imagine in any other art scene in the history of modern art. And imagine if you had that type of record of interplay between all of these creative thinkers. Like, you know, some of that stuff where it's like you've got some of those threads where you've got like, you know, you've got Chantry and Kozik and Derek Hess all talking to each other about something at the same time. Like, you know what I mean? Right. That's like, that's crazy. That's yeah. that's a craziness to to be have been able to sit and see that stuff, you know, um, and like one of the other things that occurred to me, uh, just as I was I was we were re, um, I've talked about this before and people are probably tired of it, but I'm going to be I'm in the process of starting a YouTube art channel, and so I'm filming episodes of me making what all my working. I mean, it's just, the show's going to be, this is what it's like for, to be a working artist, you know? And, um, I was, we were cleaning the studio and we were going through books, like trying to figure out what needed to get put into storage and what needed to stay out. And, um, it, it occurred to me how many books about gig poster art came out of there. Like there is a lot of books yeah. <laughs> about rock poster art. You know, because before that, there was like, there was only a, like, you know, there's the art of rock and, you know, and then people who had individual books like Frank. And then it was like, and then there was a boom of books. Yeah. Do you have your own book out? No, man, you've it's funny. Never, you've never done one either? <laughs> you know, here's the thing. It's like, and it's weird. I mean, it's, it's shameful because I've had several publishers approach me over the years that want to do a book. And as a part of me, it's like, oh, no, I'm, I'm not ready. I want to do it on my own. And, mm -hmm. and, and which is kind of nuts because I know I'm too big. Like, I need to let someone do it. Yes, uh, same. <laughs> and like, you know, especially when you get like, get to a point where like, they're all these, you know, you get like all of these artists who started after you and they've got books and in their books, they cite their influences and they're naming you as an influence mm -hmm. and you don't have a book. <laughs> and it's like, so at some point, you know, my Jennifer, my wife, she's like, you know, you gotta, you gotta let that go. Like whoever contacts you next, got to do the damn book, you know, so <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to do one, man. I mean, it's like, it's, yeah, a lot of people are on my back about that. So. Yeah. Same here. Uh, I, <laughs> you know, I've talked to people on this show and they're like, how, why dude? Like, why haven't you done this? Yeah, and I'm like, right. I don't have time. I don't have time to do it. Cause I always think of, you know, I am, you know, to, to, to kind of shout out a, a, a past guest um, and a gig posters person. I'm like Gerald Tidwell, man. Like I want to do it myself. I don't want, I don't want to have somebody else do it. Right. I want to do everything myself. And I was talking to um, the painter Candy Wild uh, just earlier this week for an episode. And she's like, Oh no, no, I let somebody else do it. <laughs> she's like, I got some, somebody compiled it for me. I'll give you their name. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they'll do it for you too. Maybe you can use this same publisher and they'll handle all that for you because yeah. you know, like I was like, I'm, I, I look in my storage and I, and it's like stacks of, of DVD burns and CD ROM burns. And I'm like, I, I, there's no way I want to go sit and look no, through who wants all to do those that? discs. Nobody. Okay. And then I mean, you gotta, lay you it gotta, out and design that's it. That's what I'm saying. I don't want to do any of that. We got, but you know, we, we, <laughs> we, you, you spend, when you do this type of work, especially art, you spend so many years being, um, and rightly so, being conditioned with a DIY aesthetic. Well, yeah. And guys like me and you uh -huh. came from the, you know, the hardcore scene in the eighties. Uh, and that, uh, yeah. And we were, I, I don't like the word, but we were literally indoctrinated into the, if, no, if yeah. you got to do this yourself, no, you don't wait do around for permission. Uh, don't wait for permission. Go yeah. do what you got to do. So I, so we got to learn, but like guys like us at some point, like, and I've, and you know, I've been really successful in some areas doing this, but in like one or two areas, like the book, I'm still resistant. Uh, we got to learn to, uh, to let, go let people let you know there are people who do certain things better than you <laughs> and the only reason that you have not accessed them previously is because a you didn't know them and two you couldn't afford them mm. when those two things get solved 
pay them to do what they do and let them do, you know, and all this trying to, yeah, man, because you'll never get anything. Do you know how long it took me just to, like, I mean, it's been a while now, but I mean, I shipped my own work for way too long. <laughs> you know, until before I finally got to a point where it's like, look, man, pay these people. That's what they do. All they do is fulfillment. Pay them. Like, what the fuck are you doing rolling up posters and putting them in tubes? <laughs> you know, but, but part of that is like recognizing, and a lot of artists have problems with this, recognizing the value of your time. Your, oh, yeah. the, the value of, of, of Mike Fisher's hour in 2010 is totally different from the value of Mike Fisher's hour in 2020. Like it's, so the shit that Mike Fisher would do on his own in 2010, it's like, it's not worth it for Mike Fisher of 2020 to do that shit. <laughs> I yeah. totally agree, man. My wife had to teach me that uh, like a lot. I was like, I, I, you know, I'd be running around trying to do everything myself. And she's like, why are you spending time on that? You could be spending your time on something totally different. Like I'd be yeah. making, you know, art prints or, you know, like uh, selling pieces for like, you know, 25 bucks or whatever, like small pieces just to just to be doing it. And she's like, yeah. you it took you 100 hours worth of time to do to make that $25 piece. What's wrong with you? Go get a job at McDonald's if that's what you want to do, you know? No, you said it, man. It just to be and that's what a lot of a lot of people do. Like they don't they don't know they 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 haven't learned to 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 determine the difference between activity and progress. <laughs> right. they're, they're two different things, you know? And some people think that activity is progress and it's not all the time. Sometimes it's just activity, man. You just <laughs> Like I can either be running on a treadmill or I can be running on the street. And one of them can take me to the store where I can <laughs> buy some stuff I need. Right. And the other one, I'm just like, I'm running in place. So it's, I don't know. It's just a shit that we learn over time, man. You know? Well, right? yeah. And, and it's another thing, like at some point, um, you know, and it, it, it is a thing that every artist I've ever spoke to has always said is there, uh, there's always like this, the illusion of the next level. You know what I mean? You're like, I got to get there. I got to get there. I got to get there. And then when you, you, you never feel like you are, but when you look back five years, you're like, Oh my God, I, I passed what I thought that right. was. And right. when you're our age and we've been, you know, you've been doing it for professionally for 25 years, 30 years. However, you know, I think I started getting paid to do this you know, probably over 30 years ago, it's like you, you know, it's like you, if you don't stop and look back and appreciate where you are and let go of some of that stuff, like you're right. Like I don't need to be doing this. Like I, I need to just be making the art and somebody else can be doing yeah. all this other crap. The other that's... stuff. <laughs> and, and, they, and they don't mind doing it because you're paying them. I, right. You, you said it, dude. It's like, it's, it sounds really simplistic, but it's hard to do to 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 focus to focus on what you're doing and at the same time be aware of the periphery mm -hmm. and, and like not only in like day to day, but like with your whole career. Like I'm focused on this project, but I'm well aware of how this project is going to impact. Mm -hmm my career and what people think and how people perceive me and uh yeah i mean you know i think we get <laughs> you know we never get we never master that you know but yeah we well and, and i don't think it's good for i don't think it would be good for us to master it i think part of that whole drive is what keeps us making new fresh stuff all the time right i mean it's like nobody wants to stagnate in the, in the, in the world of, you know, I've made it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like no, you always yeah. want to be, you know, as, you know, I think that there are probably people who do, who are, who are in a different type of art than we make, who, you know, start selling paintings for, you know, six figures where it's a whole different deal than, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like, uh, I have a friend whose name is Cyril. Um, Cyril's father is a painter in Germany and he is the guy who painted the, um, the scorpions album cover with the, the blackout with the forks in the eyes. His right. name is, his name's, uh, Gottfried Heldwein. 
and his son Cyril's a friend of mine. And like, you know, his dad's paintings are, they're the size of a, of a garage door, those paintings that he does. And, um, so like that scorpions painting, it's, it's huge. And, uh, and he gets paid like it crazy. He's crazy money to do those paintings. And it's like, they just live in a different stratosphere, you know? And it's like, yeah. I can't even imagine what it'd be like to be an artist who's at that level, you know? Yeah. I mean, and even they need to, like, even they can't be settled. There are too many people that have come before them. I, I went to see a, an exhibit before, right before the Corona shit. Um, <laughs> I went to see a, a traveling uh, exhibit of Francis Bacon's paintings. Mm -hmm. And when you read about his life, like, like, and, and they actually had his final painting there. That Like it was the last painting in the uh, walkthrough was his final painting. And, um, and so when you, when you see that kind of thing and you realize that, man, you, you know, you will never beat the art. The artist, you know, Michael, Michael Jordan used to say that about basketball. You, you, you will never be bigger than the game. You can't beat the game. And if you're an artist, man, you can't beat the game, dude. Like, and, and if you ever get to a point where you think that you've got the game beat, like you're fooling yourself, dude. You'll never beat the game. Like it's, the, the world will continually present you. And every time people think they have it figured out, like this is what art is. You know, those painters from the Renaissance and, and you know, like this is what art is. And then you get a dude like Delacroix and like, and then people say, okay, well, okay, now this is what art is. And then you get the impressionists, right? <laughs> and like, even now down the day, you know, people thought they knew what pop art was in the eighties with Warhol and stuff. And then here comes Keith Haring. And then they thought they knew what pop art was in the nineties. And, and then here comes fucking uh, Banksy and cause, you know, mm -hmm. like you'll never beat the art, dude. Yeah. I, I, you know, right now, uh, it, as it pertains uh, to the world uh, on this at this particular time, there are those um, monoliths that they're finding everywhere. Right. And um, I'm, I'm dying to know who's behind those. And it's <laughs> funny because I see so many people posting online, like, like, what could it be? Could it be aliens? Could it be like, what could it be? And I'm like, it's definitely an artist. <laughs> There's no, it's no, it, when it comes out, it ain't going to be no mystery. It's going to be oh, some dude. dude. <laughs> yeah, no. no, that shit uh, is, that shit is brilliant, man. Like whoever it's is so doing that. really good. And, and I hope it's yeah. more than one person. I hope it's like a, like a group of people. I hope it's not just like Banksy. Yeah. I love yeah. Banksy. And I think that the stuff that he does is really great. Um, you know, I, you know, there's always that, there's always that thing where, uh, people lo love to hate, love to hate on people who have some success. And, yeah. um, I, I am not that guy. Like I love <laughs> Banksy's work. I, Banksy's stuff is so rad and it's clever and I don't care what anybody, I don't care what anybody says. Yeah. It's like super clever. And, um, you know, it's one of those things like I've never been a huge street art guy, it's never really been my thing. So, you know, when I was a teenager, I really, I loved graffiti and stuff because, you know, I was kind of into hip hop culture and the, when it was burgeoning, you know, in like the early eighties, cause it kind of came up right alongside the punk scene. And there was a lot of us who went back and forth between that. And, um, and so I, I was, I was interested in street art and stuff, but when it, when we got to like the, the late nineties, two thousands, 2010s and stuff, not a super huge fan of a lot of it. Um, but the, the museum of, of contemporary art in LA did, um, like a street art exhibit and it was like all encompassing. They had everybody in it. And, um, I walked away from that with the, with the, definitely with the different impression of, of the street art stuff for sure. Yeah. And they had, they had actual Banksy stuff in there. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Now that stuff is, it's just, uh. It's, it's, it's awesome to be a part of it. I, I think being, you know, being an artist, you're part of a, a fraternity that goes all the way back to the, the cave painters and sure. And it's just, uh, I was talking to a, an artist a couple days ago and, um, this idea that I think has a lot of merit scientifically that Einstein talked about that, like, like that time is an illusion. We, we, we view time um, as linear because mm -hmm. we are trapped by three dimensions. So like we are trapped physically in a space to where the only way we can perceive the moment 
is linear. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's an illusion because the moment is all encompassing. And Einstein mentioned how like everything that's ever happened, everything that has ever that's ever happened, everything that will ever happen is all occurring simultaneously in this moment. And if you carry that over into art, then you realize that like from the cave painters at Lascaux and the hieroglyphics guys and in, in, in ancient Egypt, all the way to like us doing the little shit that we do. Like <laughs> it's all a part. Like everything that's ever happened in the history of art is one moment of expression. And so to be a part of that and, and have the, the privilege of speaking for whatever we are. Um, yeah, it's a very, it's, to me, it's almost a very religious thing, dude. It's, it's, it's no, a very I totally get sacred it. thing, you know? I, I totally get it. Um, and it doesn't matter what you're doing. Like, it's like what you're saying. It doesn't matter like what style it's in or like, that's why I can't stand these people that are like, want, they want to kind of determine the quality of art by technique. That's bullshit. Right. I, I mean, you know, and it's like, I'm so sick, you know, and I, I've heard so many guys like, you know, I used to hear people uh, when I was in high school, like talking about Keith Haring, like, man, I don't, I don't get it. I don't see Keith. I'm like, man, like, <laughs> You know, and then, and then I always tell artists, like, oh, you think, so you look at Keith Haring, you think that's simple, you think a kid could do that. And, you know, and I said, like, here, I'm giving you a five by five, five foot by five foot canvas. You do it. Do one that looks just like that. And it's, <laughs> right. And, and it's a lot harder than you think because those guys are coming at it from the other way around. Like, most people are coming at it from, like, technique. And then they sort of retrofit their ideas. They go sure. backwards from technique. Those guys are coming at it from idea first, idea. And right. to me, that's all that matters, man, is ideas. And that's why I like the East Coast art scene. Like I, I've heard people talk shit about banks. You know, it's all stencils. Or they talk shit about cars. And dude, they don't get the fact, they don't understand that like the real art world they cherish ideas. That's why the real art world ain't really impressed with like a lot of the, the West Coast scene. They just they just not because because <laughs> a lot of artists on the West Coast think that because they can paint this fucking tree perfectly, that that means that it's quality. And on some level it is, but there's another kind of way of thinking that is like, hey, but what are you saying? Like, what's the idea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot to for me to unpack there in a res in, not in response, but I have a lot a, a lot of like, thoughts about what you just said. Um, in to what you just said, um, like I can appreciate people who can render things perfectly. Yeah, um, it's a talent it's, because it's a talent. Yeah. But yeah. like, I also don't get it because like you know we have cameras, we can photograph things you know, like technique doesn't speak to me as much as, um, you know, something like, you know, like a Todd Shore painting, you know, like that is something completely different. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like he had to pull that shit out of his brain. Like you can look at a tree and you can have the skill to paint that tree, but nothing came out of you to, to, to do that other than technique. And so I agree. Ideas are what make art interesting to me. And everybody has a different idea of that. Like yeah, my mom, my yeah. mom's idea of what makes great art is completely different than mine. And she enjoys it just as much as like me and you would. Um, yeah. But yeah, like uh, one of the one of the ones that makes me crazy. And it's exactly the same same thing that you were saying about people who are like, oh, I don't know, herring, you know, whatever um, is is Rothko. Like when. Yeah. I, I, when Rothko had a painting probably in the last five or 10 years that like right. was a record breaking sale, I think it was like, I don't know, it was like $28 million, one of his, one of his, uh, color scapes. And, uh, and I saw a, a really well-known painter who does do cool stuff and they, they definitely do 
um, their own ideas and their own things. They weren't somebody who was painting trees or whatever. Um, but they were like, they were so sour grapes about it. And like, I just <laughs> don't get it. It's just a big block of, you know, it's like three big blocks of colors. Like, you know, I just don't understand why it's worth so much. And I was like, I made the mistake of being like, well, how much do you know about what Rothko was trying to say with his art? Because that's what it comes down to. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean that there wasn't something being said or there wasn't something being passed from the painter to the viewer that you're not aware of. You know what I mean? And, and then they went straight to, well, I know all about what he was trying to say. And I'm all, then shut up. If you know, then you can't be mad for how much that works selling for because it's like you don't have it both ways. Either, uh, you know, appreciate it because you know or yeah. whatever. Like just because it doesn't have a giant skull on it or but whatever you know, doesn't mean it's not cool. Yeah, <laughs> so it's, like, yeah I, I, some people just, you know, like you said earlier, man, some people just, that's what they do. They just hate. And, you know, it's funny you bring up Rothko because like I'm, I'm in my studio right now upstairs. If I walk out that door, and walk up five minutes, walk up the street, I'm at the Rothko Chapel. Like I go there all the time, right? Wow. And, and so, I, I've, and I've literally had people come here visiting or whatever, they come to visit the studio or whatever, they fly in. I had a guy come in from a, a collector from Amsterdam that flew in and, you know, booked a hotel, like, near my house and he just wanted to and the dude is a good buyer so i was like yeah i'll make time for this dude and <laughs> sure yeah i mean it was in my best interest right and uh took him to the rothko chapel because he was the same way he was like hey. <laughs> i walk your ass in that chapel and you change dude because it's you you get that um but see that's what it's about dude like he was one of those artists who understood that idea, dude, the idea supersedes, even in my opinion, supersedes even the execution. Sure. Like, and, and he and he's just sort of perfectly was able to create these moods of like solemn sacredness, dude. Yeah, I, he's what he's yeah, he's he, one he of was something. I, if there if there's a chapel uh rothko chapel i am uh and it's Dude, Roth, you, <laughs> i want to go there when, no. when this is all over now i got to come to houston just no to it's, it's it's i mean you type it into google it's it's world famous now that we here in houston um the the Manils were like this crazy art collecting thing you know rich crazy wealthy old oil money and all through the 20th century they collected uh Warhol writes about him in his diaries uh, when Urban Cowboy came out mm -hmm. uh, and they had the premiere here in Houston and uh, and the Manil, the, the, the I forget her name, but she told Andy Warhol, I'd like you to come for the premiere. And Andy was like, OK, like whenever that's the <laughs> kind of people they were like, whenever they call. <laughs> and so the Manil Gallery is like the next block over from the Rothko Chapel. Like I said, it's right, it's right here. And, um, and dude, yeah, so I go into, and it's free because they donated all that art to the city. Wow. So I go into the, the, the Manil and there are ancient, like Mesopotamian um, fertility statues that are like 6,500 years old. And then if I just walk like two minutes that way, they're like Picassos and, <laughs> you know, and that, there's a, 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 a Rene Magritte room. There's a, you know, so all of this stuff is here. And I, I think that people who think like that, they just need to see more art. Like you, they need to go somewhere and they need to like have art just sort of poured on them. <laughs> I wish I <laughs> feel like this person would benefit from that, but I honestly you don't, think, don't so. think that. I don't think they, I don't think they would. Um, no, yeah. Like, yeah, you know, it's it's weird man like I, I it's weird when it comes like i get it when it comes from like a layman that yeah. looks at like something like a rothko or a picasso or you know and and they don't quite or like a pollock and they're like you know or even a keith herring piece and they're like i don't 
like, okay, what's the big deal? And it, and I, and I think that when it comes from an artist who is like that, it's, it hurts. It cuts extra deep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like yeah. now I, you know what? I'm that motherfucker who would think less of your work because you don't get Mark Rothko's work. <laughs> no, I mean, it, you know, you have to kind of like, when somebody shows that kind of attitude, like, yeah, suddenly they, suddenly they're kind of suspect, dude. Cause I'm like, yeah, I, I, like you totally missed the whole, uh, like you missed the whole part of art. You've, you've reduced, you've reduced it to this trivial exercise. It's like a commodity almost, yeah. right? It's like, what's it worth? Why is it, wh why is it worth what it's worth? Who cares? Yeah. Who cares why it's worth what it's worth? And then, you know, and it's determined by these things like the whole idea of, is it good? Yeah. Um, yeah. There is no qualifier for art, dude. Like everything that we just said about Mark Rothko and about art and everything, somebody could hear it and could legitimately say, all that shit that they said is bullshit. None of it is right. And, <laughs> and, they, and they wouldn't be, and they wouldn't be wrong because art, right. there's no right, there's no wrong, dude. And right. So, yeah. I agree with that. I totally agree with that. There's a lot of like, again, like it, it, even as an artist, it comes down to personal taste. You know what I mean? There's tons of stuff yeah, being exactly. made. There was a ton of gig posters being made that I didn't like. You know what I mean? Speaking of painting, do you paint much anymore? I don't I can't recall seeing much painted work from you. Real I, recently. I, yeah, recently. I mean. I have to start painting more like the, the last few years I'll paint, I'll, I'll paint if it's a commission. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just like painting. I'm not just like, Oh, I want to paint. And then somebody sees it and wants to buy it. Like <laughs> same. I, yeah. I paint if I get a, if I get a call from a collector and they're like, I'd really like to buy a painting. How much are they? And, and for the last three or four years, I've been telling people that I'm not painting mm -hmm. um, because I've been focusing on other things that make me a lot happier. Uh, sure that we'll we probably talk about that Man, later, nothing but. nothing makes me happier than painting <laughs> if i could figure out a way i'm not good enough oh, at it to to, to, <laughs> to be able to make a living at it but i love i i love it and that's one of the things about um the uh the youtube art channel i'm making that i'm looking forward to having an excuse to paint right. regularly because i it's just one of those activities it's like skateboarding for me or surfing where it's like i don't think about any other thing at all while I'm doing it. And I just need more of that in my life all the time, you know, I, cause right. I overthink everything like, you know, a neurotic artist. Right. <laughs> I know. I know. But, Oh, you know, I, I, I hope you paint more. I, I always enjoyed your, your painted work. And, um, you know, I'm like at the point where, uh, I still get asked to do like gallery stuff, like gallery group shows where people be like, Hey, you want to have a piece? And I'll, I'll usually try to, so I usually get to do a painting a year for different stuff. Um, so, you know, but painting yeah, a lot yeah. is gonna, I'm going to teach myself how to oil paint on my, on my art channel and get let everybody <laughs> watch me fail at that. <laughs> no, man, you know, you do it your way, man. Cause I've never in all the years I've been painting, I've never painted with oils. I never even tried it. So yeah. it should be interesting. Do you, well, you're no. pretty much acrylic guy, right? Or I've, you, you painted, both. I, I've done both. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, I've done both and like, I don't know, there's pros and cons to both. Like I, I get it, you know, can't so. beat the speed of drying with acrylics, man. If you, if you're like, if no, you have yeah. a short attention span like me and you want to get a painting done in a day or two, <laughs> you can't beat it. That's it. That's it, dude. It's a lot less messier and a lot less toxic and, but you know, Hey, use what you got. Totally. Um, like your toy work is, I want to talk a little bit about your, about your toy work and your resin stuff. Um, I don't know. I don't have any pieces in your, of yours in my collection. Um, but again, I didn't really get super into collecting the, uh, designer toys because it's like comic books for me where I was like, first of all, if I start, I'll never stop. Right. And second of all, I felt like I kind of got, by the time I would have been able to really do it, I, it was so far ahead that I could never go back and get half the stuff that I would have wanted anyway. And so it's just like, Meh, I'll stick with toy cars. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, is, is your work, do you self publish or do you go through different toy companies? You know, I've, you know, I, I, I do both, uh, more of the big stuff, like, the majority of stuff from the last 10 years or so 
is all self done. I do it through Darrow 72 and, um, and it's just better for me. You know, it's, yeah, it's, you know, I, it's, you know, I've got, I've got all the contacts that the companies have. And thankfully, you know, I, you know, capital is a little more accessible to me now. And so sure. I just do it myself at this point, but, but, you know, from time to time, I'll do something with a, you know, with another company, if they throw out a, a deal, you know, some things are, you know, just easy and, you know, I don't turn down any money. So. <laughs> yeah, I know that. I know. <laughs> I hear you on that. I definitely hear you on that. That's my problem. And it goes back to that. What's your time worth? Like sometimes I take, I take stuff that my wife's like, what are you doing? Oh, and I'm like, well, I want to do it. I, you know, sometimes I got to do stuff I want to do just because, you know, <laughs> that's part of the joy of being an artist is doing stuff because you want to. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I get caught in that trap of, I get caught ugh, as an, as a, as a person who supports themselves completely off of their art, I get trapped in the, I can't say no yeah. trap where like, I want to say yes to everything. Cause I'm like, I don't, I got rent to pay. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, no, you know, if someone give me money to yeah. do it, I'll find a time to do it. But you know. we're, we're, we're all victims of that. Cause like I said, that, that's year after year after year that we have been trained to never say no. The job, I mean, for the, for the most of your, for the you know, most of your career, uh you've you you think like you know the job that i say no to that might be the one <laughs> so you don't say no to anything and but but again this is like this goes right along with like letting people do stuff for you like mm -hmm. at some point you you just kind of say like you know what is this activity or is this progress and a lot of time you know and you gotta because sometimes dude it'll be progress and you go like hey this is progress but most of the time <laughs> just it's just it's just something to do man and we <laughs> and we're so programmed you know we've been programmed by not just what we do for a living but by the society we grew up in I mean, from the time with little babies you know that's the whole thing you they, they want to train you to be a productive member of society so you've been <laughs> sort of conditioned from the time you were a little fella at school that if you are not producing something you are a failure mm -hmm. so we get into this thing where like i've always got to be doing something and i got to be making something i got to be doing something i got to remember and it's funny because that's kind of a Western thing, dude. If you look at the balance of human history, like motherfuckers worked when they had to. <laughs> like all them people, like all the people who did stuff like invent all the myths and fucking learn astronomy and create math, all those dudes, <laughs> like they did all of that shit because they were not working eight hours a day. They were like, like if we got to eat, we got to hunt. If we need a place to stay, we got to build this thing. If we got to move, we got to move. Otherwise, those <laughs> things are all a means to an end to fucking laying around and telling stories and playing games. And so like we, we're in a real kind of fucked up scenario here and we have to kind of unlock. And here's the sad thing, dude. <laughs> Me and guys like me and you, we have, we have the luxury of unlearning it. The average working man never gets that luxury, dude. He has to stick with that shit till the day that his body won't let him do it anymore. Yeah, but, right. But we've right. got we're, we're we're lucky, you know. We're lucky that we can even <laughs> think about that, you know. Yeah, I, I have a couple of thoughts about that for sure. One of which is, um, I think, uh, to what we've seen with American people's behavior during the pandemic um, is directly tied to that. And I think it's that, you know, what from the time we're five years old, we get up, we go to the same place, we do the same thing, we come home, we do that five days a week, we take two days off, and we do that every day until we're 18 years old. And the reason that we do that is that after we're 18, they want us to be conditioned to do that for the rest of our lives at a job. Right. And so right. we are conditioned and, and literally every single year, every single day of your life from the time you were five years old until 
the very moment where you are at this moment right. is about that. And in America, not only is that the way it is, but it's a source of pride for yeah. Americans that like you are contributing, you're working and you're contributing and you get up and you do your thing and you're, a, you're one of the, the, one of the ants in the colony. And that's yeah. fantastic. It has to be that way to some extent, but, um, when you take that away from people and you tell them they can't do it because they'll die <laughs> or they'll kill a bunch of other people, um, yeah. people couldn't handle it, man. People it goes against the that, fuck out. It you goes know, it's like that programming, man. It's like because you, they've been told since they were little. Not even told. They, it's what they've done. Well, well, here's the thing. They've been told. That muscle what is done. toned. But it, 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 what they've been conditioned to believe is if they don't do that, they'll die. <laughs> right. There's that so, too. So now you tell them that like, okay, you can't do that thing in which we have conditioned you to think that if you don't do it, you'll die. You can't do that anymore because if you do it, you might die. So like people are like freaking out. And like, to me, it's one of those deals where it's, um, because all of that is a means to an end for people's own personal gain. Sure. And I, I just think what you see in this country is uh, a, a fact that the reason this country responded differently than, than every pretty much country. every other country on the planet. <laughs> other than is, England, who did what we did. Who did well, you know, you know, <laughs> Which, that's, you know, there are, you know, you know I, I <laughs> we're the about, spawn. <laughs> that's right. I can talk about that shit too. But I mean, but think about it. The, the only... The, the, the real difference is is that in Western Anglo-American culture, the average person values their personal rights more than the well-being of the community. <clears throat> and that's the difference. My right supersedes the community. If I want to do yeah. this, if this makes me happy, like fuck the community. Like if 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 <laughs> if if I can do what I want to do and the community is accepting, then great. But we have a problem when the needs of the community go up against what I want to do. Right. And and well, it's and so it's yeah. it's just it, and and to me that's why, like I said, and and it's oddly subjective uh, too. It's oddly subjective because if that same person wants other people to get rid of their freedoms in order to allow them to do what they want yeah. that, you know, it's all subjective. It's all subjective. It easiest way to sum that up is pretty much most Americans are selfish yeah, <laughs> and, and self-centered. Um, and, and it's a weird thing that part of that is why we've been successful as a country for so long, but not to go too far down that rabbit hole. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just think that people couldn't handle, they couldn't handle not having their routine and it freaked them the fuck out, you know? Well, and then, routine, yeah, routine and then, always equals security to people. Yeah, like, well, it, that's you know. the thing, right? It's like, you're good. You, I think people just panic. They're like, oh, this is really bad. And then you have those dopamines inside of you that, you know, that get triggered by certain things. And when you don't have your regular synapses firing like i gotta get up at six i gotta make my coffee i gotta get dressed i gotta and it's like when you don't have all those things firing right you're not your body's like it gets chemically gets off balance and it's like and you go into panic mode and i think that was like a huge part i think of what we saw with all of that and then you know like anything in this country it's kind of like 9 11 where you know for like six six weeks it was like everyone's together in this and then Six weeks later, it was like we had never been more divided, and that's where we find ourselves. <laughs> it didn't take yeah. long for the for the good chemicals to wear off and turn into something else. <laughs> right on. Um, so work wise, you got anything coming up that people want to know about? Um, well, I mean, I'm always always working on little things here and there. I don't. Uh... And you have like little 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 drop days where you like. You know, every now and then you'll like put something up or, you know. Yeah, there'll be a day, yeah, a couple of days where I, you know, put something up and then I can just sort of on my, um, I'm very, 
very lucky to have a a community around collecting my work that is that that very um, they're very communal in that thinking. They take care of each other, you know. And so, if I release uh, drop information on my social media, then it sort of it spreads and. And they do the spreading. They, you know, it goes to this board, and that board, and this board, and that board, and so yeah. I mean, you know, I'll do that, and I kind of, you know, I'll tell you at least right now, I've, I've, I've got some projects that I'm working on. But you know, speaking about this whole pandemic, like, I think one of the things beneficially that it has done is it has sort of reminded everybody. Um, that you can only live one day at a time. And like we, you, you know, human beings are um, continuously struggling with the idea. That's kind of what we just talked about earlier about being able to focus on your project at hand and simultaneously be aware of the periphery <laughs> of your career. And, 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 so we got to kind of get back to learning how to live that way. Like, yeah, I know that I've got to pay the rent by or the mortgage by the end of the month. Yeah, I know that I got to do this, this, but I, but I also know that I have to be present now. Mm -hmm. And the virus and this pandemic is kind of mother nature almost kind of like grabbed us by the shirt and, and, and made us sit down. And, and because like mother nature does not give a shit about like, you know, the your personal part. rights. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, or, or, or like, Oh, well, I've, what about the vacation we planned for a year? Or what about the so-and-so is getting married this year? What about that? Or what, you know what, man, those little, those little, uh, coronaviruses, they don't give shit about your human plans, <laughs> right. you know? And so I, I kind of, it's, it's kind of reinforced some, uh, a direction I was always going in of just being like, you know, I'm just going to wake up every day and I'm just going to make what I feel like making that day. And yeah, we thankful. are fortunate to be in that position. Yeah. That's for sure, I, man. I'm, I'm lucky that I've got that, that it's financed by people who like it and collect it. <laughs> but um, so that, and then primarily <laughs> I'm doing a lot of writing lately. Cause that's, you know, talk about what makes me happy. Um, yeah, I like I like writing, and so I've been wanting to. Uh, and I'm about to release a bunch of stuff, but I've been oh cool. Yeah, In what format are you going to release stuff? Well, I mean, a lot of that is still being determined, uh, but I'm going to find ways to mix it with art, mm. so that uh, you know, so that basically the art can sort of hold hands with the viewer and kind of walk sure. them over the bridge. Well, that's and, always kind of been how you you have your works your artwork has always kind of been that way. There's always words, messages, sayings, philosophy in all of your, uh, in, in a great deal of your work. So that's not that big of a surprise that you'd like to find a way to do a more substantial project specifically around that, I guess. Yeah. Right on. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. To speak a little bit, um, I, of all of the people I've ever known who, who are self-made artists, I, you built a community of, of people who are fans of your art. I've never seen anything like it. I can't, I can't think of anyone quite like it, at least from, from our, from my peer group. Um, it's really, it's something dude, like you have a, crazy dedicated following that's it's impressive man it's it's inspiring oh that's kind man thank you yeah it's they're really good people man and um i always looked at it as uh there you know when you're an artist you look for your tribe mm -hmm. and when you find them and it's funny because man we live in a very favorite time for that because before the internet finding your tribe was like it was literally like it was a touch and go kind of look thing you know it's like if i can if i can piggyback my stuff onto something bigger than i am and get more 
you know, hardcore visibility views that way, whatever. But with the internet now, man, yeah, it's easier to find your tribe. And once you find them, uh, I was telling who was I talking to? Um, uh, J.C. Richard, the artist. He does a lot of the movie posters and stuff. Mm-hmm. I was talking to him on the phone yesterday, and um, and we were talking about that. And I was telling him that man, once like you find your tribe, there's this trust between you and them. And if you honor that trust, they will carry you, man. They will they, they will <laughs> endorse any kind of explorations you want to do. Uh, because in a way, what they are doing, I mean, it's like I remember when I like, you know, people that I sort of like looked up to, you know, like I was a big, like I was like a 14, 15 man. It was it was comic book artist and Raymond Pettibone. Like that's <laughs> That was it, right? Mm-hmm. And those people were like, I had a certain amount of almost like, you know, like di- disciple-like trust in them. Mm-hmm. You know, like, 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 I, like they were oh, showing, yeah. they they were showing me how it was done. They were speaking my language, and so, um, so yeah. I mean, it, I think I think when you find your tribe if you maintain that trust and that doesn't mean that some people, they know people will come and go. You know? Of course, of course. But I always look at it from the standpoint of my job is to make the artwork. It's not to think about how people are going to view it. Mm-hmm. And so if I just keep working, chances are that there are a few people out there who think exactly like me, like, they are not as gifted in making art as I am. But if they knew how to make art, they would make it just like I made it. So they look at me, <laughs> right. I'm like an avatar, you know? And so, sure. and you know, it's that way with music, you know? Like, it's oh, like, totally. I, yeah. wish I, could pl- I wish I could play guitar. I really do, right? I wish I could play guitar. Uh, I'm a drummer. I play drums from time to time. Mm-hmm. So when I look at a guy like Neil Peart, like I was like, dude, if I could really, really, like, really play, I would play just like him. <laughs> yeah, you know, and so it's it's one of those things I, I believe that, uh, and I think that that's where the future of art is going, dude. Like, art used to have these sort of gatekeeper middlemen who controlled everything. Yeah, that, they, I think it still I, does, unfortunately. I mean, but, it, no, but you can get around it now. You don't have to play by those rules anymore. <laughs> Because you know. I'm going to tell you something, man, you can literally, and you see that in every field of art, music, film, writing. If you find your tribe and if you understand how to, if you, if you, de- if you discover like the balance between reveal and conceal, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> then you, you can, uh, you can build something pretty special that will like take care of your needs, you know, and you'd be all right. (laughs) Yeah. That's like, uh, (laughs) it, I I totally get what you're saying, especially as a corollary to like music, um, a a little to, to go back a little bit to what I was saying about your work with having like kind of messages in it. Um, it doesn't surprise me that Ray Pettibone was like a huge, (laughs) <laughs> influence on you because yeah. while I don't think your work looks like his work, it's it's built the same way. It's built from the same place. Now that you mention it, you know what I mean. Um, like the even right. yeah, and, and I, I I love that you just told me that. And now that I have, and now I have made that connection. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I he was one of those people who was like one of the first, you know, as an impressionable kid who wanted to make art for bands. That's all I ever wanted to do when I was from the time I was like 10 years old and I was going through my dad's album collection, even younger than that, like seeing like, you know, you know, Rolling Stone album covers and, you know, just being like wanting to know what it sounded like based on what I was seeing, you know what I mean? And so I got, I got that imprinted on me. And then when I got into punk rock, it was like, you know, the art was immediately the thing that was like, which helped me hold on a second guys sneeze 
Oh, I don't have coronavirus. Bless you. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and then like someone like Pettibone, who was like, you know, was like, obviously for me, it was like, Puss Ed was a huge influence. Rick Clayton was probably even bigger influence than, um, than Puss Ed, but you know, Pettibone was right in there. And it's like, it was kind of one of those things that I even kind of grokked early on was that it was like, it was the thing you were talking about, about the idea, the idea and the expression of it was more important than how well it was done. Cause I don't think that there's a lot of people who would go, well, Ray Pettibone's one of the best rendering artists that's ever lived. Cause that's <laughs> not what his work is about at all. It's about the immediacy and if he, of if, what he's if, trying to say, it. you know, if and he so, was, if, 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 if he was a better renderer, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. At it all. wouldn't work. It, it, it would have <laughs> left me flat, dude. But the right. fact it was, it, it, you, it, it was so, his work had an urgency to it. It's yeah. like, it was the urgency. I remember when I first saw the the, the cover to the the uh, Nervous Breakdown forty five. Yeah, that was the, the one. Flag. Yeah, and dude, and it's like, and it's like this big. It's like this big dude coming into a room fixing a fight, and 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 this little guy that's kind of fending him off with a chair, you know. And it's like it 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 was just like you said, the immediacy and the urgency of the moment. It's almost like Pettibone said. It's almost like. The moment was so powerful and intense, and Petty Bone was like, "Give me a pen, I got to get this down." And he boom, 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 and he, and to me, that carries a certain amount of swagger because it says, "And look, I'm the guy that is done. You know, I've I've done the, I've done the, you know, the sit down and work on it seven or eight days detail pieces. I've done that, sure. you know. But to me, there is a certain kind of swagger <laughs> that comes from the." Uh, you know, Bern Hogarth said that. Bern Hogarth said, the first half of my career, um, I used as many lines and as much detail as I could to make a point. Mm -hmm. The last half of my career, I tried to make the most powerful points that I could with the fewest amount of lines. Like that to me is like, there's a certain kind of, I don't know. I don't even know a, a, a way I would, a, an adjective or anything. It's, yeah, it's just, I, that to me is what I love, you know? Yeah, I, I agree with you on that totally. And 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 I feel like your work, uh, you are a way better renderer than Ray Pettibone. Uh, oh, man. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I would say that uh, your work speaks the same way. Like, you, you found a way, I don't know, like, for me, like, your work is a really good um, sum of the influences, um, that, that you've had, um, whether, you know, it's like when you're doing a poster for a certain band and you find a way to put your idea on it, and then you find a way to put your thinking on it. And there's one behind you that has the, those beetles with the monsters. I, I can't see it all the way and I don't remember what band it's for but like that is a good example of you taking like how you know your influence from the Beatles and doing your thing with it and making it say what you wanted to say um you did that a lot in your work and I always really liked that and when when we first you know we're we're becoming friends and stuff you sent me like a care package once and it was just a huge roll of of prints and you know i still have all that stuff in my flat file <laughs> and they're like cherished cool, possessions cool. and then you know they were yeah. early work you know they were from like some of your earliest work but you were already at it from the very yeah. beginning with doing that and um you know me and you are we have a mutual um close friend in kozik and um I think, you know, he's obviously, he's probably my, my biggest art influence of the last 25 years. And I think he's probably my favorite artist of all time. Um, as far as, you know, kind of a peer in a peer level, like, I mean, it's like, he's not Mark Rothko, but, and he, and he would laugh to even have his name mentioned in the same <laughs> sentence. But, um, I think even more so, cause Frank was doing that. But I think you took it, I think you kind of took it, took that and you kind of took your petty bone thing. And, um, and I think you took it somewhere higher 
um, than both of those people were doing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if that's, you know, kind of. That's that's kind of you to say and almost uh, and almost uh, blasphemous and insane. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I know. And and I'm I'm trying to be careful there with it. No, but I I, I, I appreciate (laughs) it. No, but I'll say like those guys, you know, Frank obviously was, you know, we were both in Texas, so he was a a direct influence. No, nobody could ever look at your work and not, and not know you were influenced by Frank Kozik. Yeah, you know, but see, I always tell people when you start as an artist, I firmly believe that when you first start as an artist, you spend the first several years of your career copying your influences. And then somewhere, you know what I mean? It's somewhere yeah, along yeah, the way. I got caught in that trap. <laughs> oh, you do. But, but, but you know what? It's what you're supposed to, because somewhere along the way, you know, that old Miles Davis line, it takes a long time to learn how to sound like yourself. Absolutely. And somewhere along the way, you find, you 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 you, you do it. Sometimes it happens gradually. Sometimes it happens suddenly on one piece and you find yourself. Oh my God, that's me. Mm-hmm. And and so those guys like, you know, P- Pity Bone and Kozik. I mean, Kozik, I would see his stuff just kicking around town here all the time, like back before he was even doing screen prints when it was just... Xerox fly- flyers, mm-hmm. and um, and I remember the first time that I saw him do a screen printed poster. I went to the show. It was a butthole surfer show at the Vatican here in Houston, and mm-hmm. it was this little this little kid with the LSD tab and the uh, and the axe in his hand. You know, <laughs> I think he's like, doing, and, uh, uh, I think he's doing a blotter piece of that right now. Like a, I think is a print oh, okay. edition of that coming out as a blotter piece. Literally well, that man, exact that, one. Like I think it. I think he posted it today. That's crazy. okay. Well, when when I saw, <laughs> when, I remember seeing that, and um, I was telling I was telling J C uh, Richard, like for me it was like it's like imagine yourself in China and you're walking down the street and there's thousands of people around you and everybody's speaking obviously like Mandarin or Chinese or whatever, but somewhere in the crowd you hear somebody speaking English. You like looking around who. And that's what seeing that poster was like for me. I was like, oh my God, like this dude is speaking my language. And Frank kind of showed me like what could be possible. Mm -hmm. Like Frank showed me like, okay, like you remember, you know, I love these quotes. I keep throwing quotes out from people, I'm sorry, but. (laughs) No, it's great. Ian Mackay said like punk rock doesn't mean shitty right like you can you can do it with some style and quality and swagger and so when i saw frank doing posters for these bands like the fucking butthole surfers and the lime spiders and poison idea but he's doing them like it's he's doing them these glorious designs and all the color and the and i'm like oh yeah i can do like this the one poster that he did that that made me want to do posters because I always did little art, whatever. But you know, back the time when we came up, like like right now, every kid coming out of high school or coming out of art college, they all want to do posters, right? They all want to be poster artists, right? But when we or were younger, artists. it was like what everybody. Want, oh yeah, when we back back twenty thirty years ago, everybody wanted to be a comic book. Like I want to do comic books, like you know. And so I remember like coming out and seeing. I remember when Kozik did, it was the Nirvana poster in 93. Weird with the gopher, I, I, psychedelic yeah. gopher thing. <laughs> yeah. I actually, I, I actually own the original art. It's hanging in oh, my house. Oh, whoa. Yeah. I mean, whoa. I'll tell you what, because it was that piece. Literally, it was that piece that uh, I looked when I saw it. I saw it hanging in a in sound exchange. And I said, I can do that. I can do that. That's exactly what happened with me and Frank. I saw his work and I was like, yeah, I not only can I do that, that's what I want to do. That's what I want. But you know, here's the deal. Like, and this is where we were talking about, like, like to me, the real powerful art is always accessible. Sure. Now, like the powerful art says the powerful art doesn't bowl you over and make you feel less than. Mm-hmm. 
Look at the history of modern art, man. Look at the pieces that have stood the test of time. Think about what they are. Let's say the last 150 years. Think about them. Starry Night, The Scream, um, Egon Chalet's self-portraits. Persistence uh, of time. Persi think of all of that stuff. <laughs> it, it's very, it's very, you know, persistence of time is probably a little different because that's the really, you know, Dolly was really complex. But I love Dolly. But, <laughs> if you look at the majority of the stuff, Pollock, Rauschenberg, uh, Lichtenstein, Warhol, Basquiat, it's all very, like, you stand before it and you say to yourself, I can do that. <laughs> it's, 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 it's ownable. Mm -hmm. That's when art becomes powerful. Because if I look at a piece of art that you did, and, and you the way you've designed it, you have left me the ability to take possession of it and own it myself. Then guess what, dude? You, as an artist, you, your work will live, will go on and on and on because you have given each person who sees it the ability to own it and then they are going to cherish it and promote it, not because of you, but because of them. It becomes like, <laughs> this is, this is my thing. You know, how many times have you heard it with music? That's my band. Right. Right. Totally. You know, and so that's to me like what guys like Kozik and Pettibone and even when I see like Warhol or when I, you know, Basquiat or when I see these new guys like Cause and Banksy, like they have created work that is attainable. It's mm -hmm. not so, you know, it's not like. You know, when you stand in front of a Leo, Leo da Vinci painting or Michelangelo sculpture, like it's beautiful to look at, but it's not really attainable. Like you look right. at it and you go like, <laughs> you know, you're so bowled over by the, and, and, and that, in that, you start to see the allure of a Warhol or a right. Kiparin right. or a Mondrian. It's attainable. And so people... Another quote, Maya Angelou, what she say? Uh, say, people will forget what you say. They'll even sometimes forget what you do. The only thing they will remember is how you make them feel. And right. if you as an artist have found a way in your art to make your viewers feel powerful, dude, you're going to make them, you, you good. You're going <laughs> to. Dude, you know totally. I, mean? I love it. I love it. And that, you know, that kind of comes from also like where we come from, where it comes from that DIY thing of like, you know, uh, like it, 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 and, and, it, and it, what you were saying, you know, kind of the Ian Mackay thing, it's like um, this isn't, you know, it's like that whole spirit of if if Pettibone was like your guy um, visually when you were coming up. Ian Mackay was my guy philosophically yeah. and musically. Like he is him and Henry Rollins are my heroes on earth. You know, um, you, you know, how, you know how I feel about, uh, about Henry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember. Are you for <laughs> or had, against? <laughs> we, no, we, I, we, we, I think we had a conversation once. Uh, we and must I, and I, my deal with Henry Rollins is this too. I, I'll say this real quick and then I'll let you say to you. Um, Probably the worst year of my life was 1996. Whole mm -hmm. lot of shit I'm not gonna go into, but like my life literally like fell to pieces, right? Mm -hmm. And and I pulled out an old record that I had for a while, and that record helped get me right. And that was uh, the end of the silence, the end of silence by Henry Rollins Band. Mm -hmm. That record, basically, in some ways preserved me through that through those stormy waters you know it preserved me and well here's what's funny i did i've done a couple prints for rollins i did a print for him a uh, years later this would have been like 99 or something mm -hmm. and uh and so i went to the show <laughs> just to like you know i had a print i was like i really would like to get hank rollins to sign my print you know mm -hmm. So I went and um, went up to this place called Numbers here in town, legendary venue. So I walk up, you know, and I'm thinking I'm going to go like at about three or four hours before the show. I walk up and Rollins is like sitting outside, dude, just in front of the place in a van. 
like in a van, like I'm not making it up. He was sitting in a van. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I go up, I go up to him and I go like, Hey man, uh, my name is Jermaine. I did the poster and he had already had a couple that the promote that the promoters gave him. And he was like, Oh man, this is, uh, and it, you know, kind of buffed up my ego. This is, uh, uh, uh. and, uh, and I, and I said, I just have to tell you this, man. I went through a really, really tough time in my life. And among a few other things, your record, The End of Silence, just like helped me get right, man, for real. And I want to say thank you. It's an amazing album. And and this is what he said. He he like <laughs> he looked at me and he shook his head and he said, I was like, I was like, it's an amazing album. He's like, Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> and that's all he said. <laughs> I mean, like he, it, <laughs> it was, it was like perfect, perfect Rollins, but I don't mean to interrupt you, but, but no, yeah, so yeah. It, I mean, Rollins, yeah, we're all, we're, we're, we're all good with that. Both of those guys. I, 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 you know, I was at, I got, to, I am fortunate enough to have gotten to see Black Flag when they were still on their run, not in their prime, but when they were still going in the, you saw the long 80s. hair, you saw long hair, Henry, right? Yeah, I saw they all had long hair except for Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, even Bill Stevenson had fucking long hair. Um, and, you know, it was like one of those things like me and my friend were just sitting watching. It was like between opening bands. We were in this, you know, big, uh, you know, theater type venue in, in Palo Alto called the New Varsity. And Black, Black Flag played there every six months for, you know, probably ever and so you know i got to see him a few times there before they were finally finished and me and my friend rich were just sitting there sitting there not even like and he just like came over and sat down and just started talking to us you know and it was like it's fucking henry rollins and it was like and he just was like <laughs> hanging out like he just sat down and started talking to us. it was very intense he was a very intense guy and he was clearly you know fucking with us in some level of like i'm just gonna sit down and talk to these kids and they're gonna trip out on that shit um but i've always had uh, you know i've always valued his outlook on life and and for a long time there was always a lot of talk that him and ian were friends when they were growing up and i don't think the scene at large knew exactly outside of dc that they were basically brothers i mean they were they were the best of friends and um and so they both kind of became super huge influences on me, completely separate from each other. Um, and, and so, yeah, just there's, they, they're almost a yin and yang in a lot of ways where Henry is like, you, you must be productive at all times <laughs> for the sake of productivity. And Ian is definitely like, let's make something really great type of person. You know what I mean? And, um, but like, my wife uh, does, it, people who listen know, my wife does hair for TV and, and movies. And she was working on this project. And I wish I could remember the name of it because it was some crazy ass German word. And it was like a black and white short. And it had Iggy Pop and Lemmy and Dave Grohl. And like, you know, all it, it was just chock full of rock stars. And Rollins was on it for a day and she was working on that and she got to do like Lemmy's hair and stuff. And so she was pretty stoked on that. And then she came home one day and she's like, Hey, I got to work on Henry Rollins today. And I was like, Whoa, that's fucking awesome. And she's like, and, and I got this for you. And she had taken one of my, I can't remember which one it is because I have all of his spoken word books. She'd taken one of them and she'd had him sign it to me. Like, Hey, Mike, glad you like my work, Henry Rollins or whatever. And she's like, I thought you might think that was cool. And I, it was insanely cool. And it's like, I don't have the, uh, the autograph of too many people because I am not that guy. But I have Ian McKay's autograph and I have Ernie Rollins' autograph. Um, and, that, yeah. that, and then, you know, like one ice hockey goalie that I grew up worshiping. <laughs> and that's like it. And um, so, yeah, you know, it, you know, we were, you talk about living in a privileged time. Uh, just in general for people like us. And uh, one of the things that I definitely am, it's every single day, I'm thankful that I found myself in the time of and into that har American hardcore scene. Like, so every single positive thing about my life since I was 12 years old and I discovered that, it all comes back to that. 
You know, it all comes back to the things I learned there and the ways of seeing the world that I got from there. And, um, you know, I, I talk about it on the show sometimes, like how uh, it must be interesting because my parents listen to this show. Um, they, they're, you know, they, my mother is an artist and she likes to listen because she just likes to hear different people talking about making art and stuff. And she, you know, she wants to support what I'm doing and stuff. And, uh, it, I think it's interest. It must be extremely interesting for my parents to hear how positive that was for my entire life and who I am as a human being on planet earth, uh, from something that they thought was so such a dire mistake at the time. Yeah. Like they could not have been more concerned about where my life was going when I was getting involved in all that stuff. And so it must be interesting for them, you know, to hear that it's the most positive thing that's ever happened to me every single day of my life. It's, you know, so to, to kind of, you know, like when you talk about Pettibone and what he meant to you and you talk about Ian McKay and, and, and his influence and Rollins and all that stuff, like, you know, that's my entire life. Like that is wow. my entire life. And then you had skateboarding in on top of that. And, you know, like it's crazy. It's crazy. And, you know, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to let you go back to your life. No, I think I, <laughs> I think I've talked your ear off long enough, man. And I, I really appreciate you coming on and giving me your time, man. I know you're a busy guy and you're always up to something. And I appreciate you giving me your time, man. It's really, really cool to catch up with you for sure. Man, it's a it's a pleasure, and like I said, um, um, really, really, really glad that you that you are doing the show. I know there's something you wanted to do, and uh, and good luck, man. I mean, I you got good luck. Sometimes it's a <laughs> is a is a is a is a a loaded thing to say because it implies that everything that's being done is is up to fate because and i know that's not the case you put a lot of work into it but yes, this is a lot of work that said may the uh may may, may casual fate roll the <laughs> dice your way yeah i mean yeah. you know as a podcaster it's funny i was talking to i had another podcaster on the show who i recorded uh you know me being me i always record three months worth of people in like four weeks so that I always have episodes in stockpile. I don't do this like, you know, I don't record the guests the week that they're going to be on. Like I <laughs> over fucking work it. Um, so I've, I had a podcaster. I had a podcaster on as a guest that I was talking to the other day. And we were talking just about, you know, podcasting at this particular time in history. And we both came to the conclusion that once everybody can go back to work, the number of podcasts available and viable is going to be cut down by about 70 <laughs> percent because everybody decided they had time and and you know it's it's, it's you can do you could get started on the cheap if you want to but there's a hey, lot of them that's out what right we now talked about. that's what we were talking about earlier you got to find your that's, tribe right well finding your tribe and too like you know we were not meant we were not meant to to, to work with a side of living it was the <laughs> other way around and so I think people are discovering their passions with, in these times. And there'll be a lot of good good stuff that'll last out of here. Yeah, um, I mean, I'll, that was kind of what happened with the with the recession, right? Is like a lot of maker businesses started up because people lost their jobs and they didn't have any way to make a living. And they're like, I guess I'll start that furniture company or, yeah, you know, that exactly. beard oil company or, <laughs> or that craft brewery well, or whatever it is, you know. Uh, that is me, also me, the American spirit is like, mm, well, I'll yeah. just figure it out. Yeah. Let me say this, too, before I go. Um, some of your viewers are probably wondering, like, OK, he's doing he's doing the interview. He's been talking a long time. He's inside of a house. <laughs> Why in the world is he wearing a face mask? I, I so thought it's because you didn't want to infect me, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I'll tell you why. So we've been talking now for a nice little minute. <clears throat> And you know what? I'm not out of breath. I'm not winded. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. So, and just, and, and you know, how long? We've been talking, what, nearly two hours? Hour, yeah, hour, about two hours if you count the before we started recording. Yeah. yeah. So I, I only say all of that to remind you to please wear your mask during these times and to say, 
I just wore mine nearly two hours, and all you have to do is when you run up to the store, when you go out to get this, or when you have to go and pick up the kids, or when, wear a mask. The sooner that we can get past this, uh, you know, it's interesting. The last time this pandemic stuff happened to us, to, to the world, was about a hundred years ago, Spanish influenza, nineteen eighteen to roughly nineteen twenty. Remember what followed Spanish influenza. It was a time so bomb ass good that they call it the <laughs> Roaring Twenties, right? I mean, pe we, people just like, it was so, people went wild that they caused the depression 10 years later, right? So yeah. just think, just think, if we can get through this, we got a lot of parties to look forward to, but wear your mask and let's Agreed. get this. Agreed. Over. And, you know, it, people who've li who listen to the show probably heard me say, my daughter is a um she's a front liner front liner she works at a covid testing facility and um i would like her to stay healthy <laughs> so the less people that go have to go to see her the better the better it is for me and my family so if i'm being selfish wear a goddamn mask so my kid doesn't die yeah man give our love to your daughter she's doing some that's that's service man <laughs> yeah she she has a big heart and you know totally random little last little parting statement is that all of my kids are fans of your work because they had your work hanging in their room, their in their bedrooms when they're growing up. And so they'll be excited to watch this uh, and wow, be able to, cool. to listen to Jermaine talk a little bit. Right on. Thank you, man. I all right, that. man. I'll let you go. Uh, you know, when, again, when things open back up, when you're in LA, I know you come to Disneyland every now and then we're season pass holders. Um, let me know and we'll go hang out with you. And if you if you find yourself back up in the L.A. area around um, any of that stuff, like, you know, uh, designer con, um, I'll, I'll be having guests in here to record and we'll do another one. OK, looking forward to it. All right, man. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care, man.